because oftentimes when we create our timelines, we create them based off of our own interests. We create them based off things that make us comfortable. And we more than likely stay connected to people that we like to see and people that make us comfortable. And so we don't allow a lot of room for information that is going to conflict what we feel and information that goes against what we think. And so what more people need to do now is to understand that your timeline is more than likely a bubble and not necessarily a true depiction of the world. You are now listening to the Highlight Reel Builder for Authors, the Going North Podcast. I'm your host, certified self-leadership trainer and author of the best-selling book, Stay the Course, Dom Brightman. And you're going to be getting some goodies today from the guest that's up next. Today's episode is sponsored by the book that will empower you, encourage you, and through its expression, help you to advance to your next level. Stay the course. The Elite Performers, Seven Secret Keys to Sustainable Success by this guy right here you're hearing. And the good news is you can now hear the book on audiobook. So head over to Amazon.com or Audible.com or Apple Music, pick up the audiobook, and that's today's sponsor. Go out and buy a copy or a few of Stay the Course, The Elite Performers, Seven Secret Keys to Sustainable Success, and Advance North to Your Next Level of Greatness. And today on the Highlight Reel Builder for Authors, known as GMP, the great, glorious, and glamorous, it's the Going North Podcast, and we're back at you again with another fellow super special awesome human, especially of the uh, chocolate persuasion for uh, good old Black History Month 2022, baby, that's right, because today's (laughs) guest in particular, my man put pen to paper because my man is a renaissance man, an entrepreneur, business consultant, writer, public speaker, and experienced human resources professional. So that's right, folks. When you're calling HR today, well, actually, don't call HR today unless you're calling this man right here, the one and only TH himself, Mr. Tyler Hendon. How you doing today, Tyler? I'm good, Dom, man. That was a, that was an amazing intro. I think you gave me too much credit, but I appreciate <laughs> you. <laughs> don't worry. No MasterCard today, man, so you all good. <laughs> all right, look, I appreciate it. I absolutely appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now, 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 if I give you like student loan debt, that'll be too much credit for real. Let me stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my man gave me more credit funny. than a student loan debt. Like, oh, I don't know how I live up to this. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's tough. <laughs> You be like, man, that was, those expectations are too high, man. Like, yo, take the blood out of his hand from that one, man. That's too much weed, man. Too high of expectations. Like, stop it. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, but hey, the good news is, uh, as with all introductions, no matter no matter how great they are, there's always stuff I miss. So mine filling in in the cavities I may have missed about you, my man? No, sir. That was perfect. That was perfect and appreciated. Okay, all right, cool, cool, cool. That's what I'm talking about today. So, man's got this super special, awesome book that actually released, actually, probably about a couple weeks ago at the time of this recording, man. So, what made you decide to finally join the business of immortality and pen yourself a book, especially a wonderful novel? Thank you, Dom. Uh, You know, it's interesting because I spent a little bit of time, well, actually a lot of time, uh, just being observant in terms of how people interact with social media. And so after I got curious, I wondered to myself, like, who's really writing about this stuff? And then I also thought, you know, because I know we talked a little bit about Black history before we started recording. I thought to myself, is there a person of color, you know, writing about these issues? Is there a person of color writing about how social media is impacting young people, how it's influencing people's decisions, um, how it's playing a part in informa- uh, misinformation? Um, And as I did more research, I didn't find a lot of people in that space, man. So I think that was kind of encouraging to me because I said, you know, maybe I can have a voice in that space and be able to uh, really educate people on some of these issues in a way that can help them and make their life a little bit better 
when they do log on and when they do take part in social media. Oh yeah, man. Definitely can say that again. Uh, <laughs> Cause as you were talking, like the <laughs> wonderful Mike Tyson quote popped in my head about, uh, of course not the plan, but the problem is like people, social media made people too comfortable <laughs> talking trash to people <laughs> without getting punched in the face. So it's like, yeah, cause back <laughs> in the day, like you said this stuff to people they will find you like you put it in newspapers they will find you and probably your family mm-hmm. too nowadays it's like oh they might block you some people may be like i'm just gonna leave it right there and let people laugh at you so yeah man <laughs> yeah it's that uh it's that anonymity man it's that ability to interact with people from thousands of miles away and then choose to do it however you please you know i mean dom if you wanted to you could make a bunch of accounts and bully a bunch of people online all day if that's something you wanted to do and you ultimately could get away with it right it could be very limited or there would more than likely be very limited uh, repercussions you know and consequences to your actions depending on what you say and do so I think it has you know changed the way people interact with each other and it has given us more lanes to um, bully people if we choose to Oh, yeah, you can say that again, man. Like, shoot, like, well, the only drawback is, like, better be careful you bully because I still remember one social media post from a few years ago where I think it was some kind of white supremacist or somebody said something stupid. And apparently the group Anonymous came out of nowhere <laughs> and was like, hey, is this you? And then the dude responded, dude, what black magic is this? <laughs> Because they found that man's IP address attracted back to his home address and his real name. So it's like, it's like, yeah, there's some there's some anonymity, but uh some people, if they ain't using the VPN or whatever too, if they ain't really tech savvy, then uh they gonna find you you really piss them off the wrong way if it's the wrong person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can absolutely see that. Yeah. If somebody works hard enough, they could probably find you. Especially if you make that kind of mistake and you're doing the wrong thing. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, man. So with uh, being a wonderful black man out here doing the good work indeed and joining the business of immortality, what what are probably the main thing, probably the main three things that have stuck out to you in this wonderful <laughs> mirage, but probably not so mirage world of social media? Yeah. Okay. So main three things. Uh, number one, I would say people, I think that people don't spend enough time understanding how transactional social media is. You know, I've come to look at social media in the same way that I look at like a transaction with like a Amazon or a Target or something of that nature. Like when I log on or walk into the store, I know that I'm getting ready to trade one thing to get something out of it, right? Um, and so with social media, you know, we're trading our time uh, as opposed to just spending dollars. Uh, so I just, I've just come to look at it differently. And I think when people do get into that space where they look at it differently, they'll be a little bit more equipped to deal with the problems that we see online because they'll see it as more of a business as opposed to just this app that I just downloaded and I happen to like. Right. Um, so I would say that's number one. Number two, man, you know, I think misinformation is having a huge, huge impact on our culture and on people, just people in general, uh, because a lot of people, you know, gather information online and see information online and they come to this space where they come to believe it is true without stress testing that information. And by stress test, I mean, putting that information or your own opinion up against other opinions or Um, conflicting information. It's really easy for us now to find things that align with what we believe. And when we do that, it creates this bubble for us to just see the world in one perspective, um, as opposed to, you know, if we look at information that conflicts what we believe or what we feel, it gives us a broader view of what's going on in the world. And I actually think it helps us to understand other people more. And, you know, Dom, I'd say the third thing is that we need to understand that more and more data is coming out about how social media is affecting young people, how we have all these young people um, that are stressed and anxious um, and that feel deprived and sad when they log on. 
this data is coming from the biggest, you know, social media companies on the planet, right? Coming from the Facebooks of the world. Uh, and so now we have some choices to make uh, as adults, you know, people like me and you that have maybe have young people in their life, whether it be kids or nephews, nieces or anything of that nature. We actually have the ability to inform them about how social media functions and about being careful in terms of how they interact with social media, because the last thing we want is for our kids to have more problems, right? You know, I think um, there are so many other things in the world going on that are stressing people out that the last thing we need is for our kids to feel stressed and anxious and sad when they get on this app and decide to swipe all day. Um, so it's just something that I think we need to uh, really think about. And those are probably my top three. Uh, solid indeed, solid indeed. And especially with the number two, they really stuck out kind of like the whole meat of the whole thing as well, since you have a journalism background. And that's the main thing that probably sticks out is the whole misinformation piece, because we're, we're really living in a clickbait era on steroids, because the thing is, like folks see headlines like, oh, Lord, well, that's probably the truth or whatever, without actually clicking the article and reading it and seeing what the heck is going on and like heck even so and you know what that's that's probably a good transition question that i didn't even think of is the fact that any advice for those in this uh wonderful misinformation era to uh any tips for making sure you validate your sources properly because a lot of folks may be like oh first page of google all right i'm in yeah <laughs> yeah no that's a great point man so i'll say if, number one it depends like if it's um an important issue, then we absolutely need to put that information that we're receiving up against other information. Uh, because what we can actually do is realize that legitimate journalism still exists, right? There are still people that go to school and take the time to become journalists, learn the rules, uh, like the tricks of the trade, and then abide by, the, abide by those rules and policies and whatever else that looks like. So those people exist, right? And they have a platform uh, and they spread information. We have to do our best to find and interact with those people when it comes to information sharing. Uh, and at times be weary of just anyone or taking the opinion of anyone sharing information. Because now, you know, Dom, we live in a time where you don't have to have any type of credentials or experience to essentially play the role of a reporter online. You just have to have an account. Uh, and so that's a drastic difference from what we saw you know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, so I would say that's the number one thing, man. Like look for legitimate news sources. And when it comes to controversial or political issues, uh, try to put the opinion of that news source or whatever news source you looked at um, up against other news sources and see okay, well, where do the facts lie on this important issue? What are the things they're both saying about it that I can believe to be true, as opposed to what are the things that are actually like a, a spin or the things that you could consider to be um, a part of that, um, a part of that news station's uh, appeal for a certain audience? Because you and I both know, you know, all these different news stations have certain appeals, right, to certain demographics, but None of them, at least in my opinion, whether they be Fox, CNN, or MSNBC, none of them report completely false information, right? They just more so cater it to the people that tune in to be a part of their program. Uh, so I think there's a, a balance there that people could stand to find and benefit from. Uh, yeah, definitely can say that again. Definitely can say that again. I love the fact that you said legitimate journalism still exists. And hey, that's even why this podcast exists and the, quite a few many others exist too because it's like hey like uh the big uh news companies uh sometimes they go by the uh classic phrase if it bleeds it leads and like to put a <laughs> uh, a lot of propaganda out there heck even remember one guy on social media was like oh this uh newspaper is a propaganda rag <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm like, God dang. Well, so all right. Yeah. So it's like, Hey, just definitely got to be able to pay attention to what the sources say and heck even using the sources that are cited on Wikipedia pages as helpful hints too. Because that's the other thing too, especially with the 
folks who've been writing papers in high school or college like hey don't go to wikipedia that's not a source it's like hey, <laughs> oh yes it is just uh go to the actual sources list at the bottom and see where it is and then just go into that rabbit hole and see where the information is coming from and just asking yourself like hey who is uh writing this and are they really do they really have credentials or do they just have a bunch of followers are they being paid to say this because we got a lot of that mm -hmm. too so like man like definitely glad you brought that up man so my goodness man so with this wonderful book mirage so was it the whole journalism background just the lack of i guess not only representation with this topic but also with the Eh, well, I wouldn't say it's like really a bad thing. Social media depends on what you use it for. Like, is there any other reason that stuck out besides uh, just a need for having another voice out there and curiosity? Yeah, definitely uh, more reasons, Dom. You know, there was a part of me that when I first started researching the different topics in the book is I wondered, like, what makes someone get on social media and do something crazy? Or, <laughs> or right um and, or something that something that i i can never see myself doing something that i'm saying wow that's crazy uh that makes no sense to me like i i got really curious about people's behavior online uh it made me wonder do people know that this stuff can impact your life down the line do they know that someone can easily screenshot one of your tweets and keep it forever and then one day choose to use that tweet to stop you from getting a job or opportunity. Are people aware? And as I paid more and more attention, um, I found a mix of answers, right? Some people know, some don't know, some don't care. Um, but either way, there's truth in however people feel. Because the truth is that we know that social media it has the ability to impact our lives in the short term and long term. We now just have to decide where we fall in that. And what's the right fit for us and our life and our dreams and our goals. So I would say that's probably the biggest thing, man. Like just, I got really curious about what motivates people to make certain choices online. And I got very curious about the choices that didn't make sense to me. So I had to make other people's choices make sense to me. And then when I did that, that's when I really started doing my writing and putting things together and started formulating a book that, um, you know, I truly believe isn't just a one-sided view because I tried to look at it through multiple perspectives. Ah, uh, that's good indeed. That's good indeed. So any thoughts on social media as a whole? Do you feel like it's bad and unhealthy or do you feel like it's healthy and good? Like it, any, any thoughts about it as an overall whole? Yeah, it's a great question, Tom. You know, I think it's a mix. I don't think it's a it's all the way bad or all the way good. Because if you think about it, you know, we can use social media for a lot of cool things. You know, people use social media con to connect with their families, right? You have people that can use free apps to call their family, to video chat, to um, essentially connect with the world. You know, there are people that are super talented and they can make a TikTok tomorrow, show their talent, and the next thing you know, they have the world or a lot of other people buying into their talent uh, and that could change their life. You know, we have people that launch businesses on social media and use these apps to constantly market their business, to find new customers and to profit. So I think that stuff is really cool. And I think it would be kind of silly for me to say social media is all bad, but at the same time, in terms of the culture of social media, there are absolutely a lot of issues and things that need to change. Some of those issues are apparent, you know, like the misinformation and all this data we see coming out about how social media makes people feel. But then some of them are a little bit quieter. Uh, so, you know, there's there's good and bad on both ends. Uh, so I won't say it's all good or it's all bad, but I do think 100% there are parts of social media that are dangerous and that need to change. Ah, all right. Good deal. Good deal. So any other parts of social media to avoid that are dangerous outside of the misinformation? Yeah. You know, I talked about this a little bit down, but I want to spend a little bit more time on it. I think that we need to be careful about creating what are called echo chambers. And so an uh, echo chamber is essentially when you put out information into the world or online, and what you receive back is confirmation of whatever it is you put out. So if I'm saying 
if I'm tweeting or I'm believing to myself, you know, um, there needs to be more gun rights or something of that nature. And then the information I'm constantly getting back online is other people saying, yes, there do need to be more gun rights. I need to be careful about believing that information to be a worldview or the opinion of many people, because oftentimes when we create our timelines, we create them based off of our own interests. We create them based off things that make us comfortable. And we more than likely stay connected to people that we like to see and people that make us comfortable. And so we don't allow a lot of room for information that is going to conflict what we feel and information that goes against what we think. And so what more people need to do now is to understand that your timeline is more than likely a bubble and not necessarily um, a true depiction of the world. Um, and I give some good examples in the book, but one thing I talk about in the book, Dom, is uh, around elections. You know, if you if you follow elections, you'll see oftentimes more than likely the people you follow, for most of us at least, are probably going to have similar views as you because these are people that you like to connect with. While on the other side of America, there are, you know, let's say 10, 20, 30 million people that don't see the world the same as you at all. Um, and so I think we can benefit from understanding that our timelines are bubbles and that if we decide to, and if we really want to learn what's going on in the world, um, we have to be open to new information and we have to be open to information that makes us just a little bit uncomfortable. Amen to that, man. I'm so glad you mentioned echo chamber and defined it for folks because um, that's actually true. Heck, even reminded me of a couple of things, especially um, one of the past guests on our show, which is still can't believe my God, almost 300 episodes ago, uh, near AL. He's actually a Stanford professor. His first ever book that really went public it was actually a book called hooked about really habit but basically like habit performing products and like just making it based off of human psychology and even the fact of um the classic tony robbins examples like hey like look for brown all over the place or when you buy a particular car it's like oh you, you don't see it that often but when you buy one of your own you see it everywhere and it's like we're creating our own little bubbles and it's kind of like and I guess it may even te might even have to do with a little bit of a touch of cognitive science too, where it's like, hey, what you really think about, you bring about, and what you bring around you the most, especially the way that the internet is, especially Google, with all these cookies everywhere tracking you and selling you these ads and whatnot. It's like, hey, it's, they try to give you more of what you like so you can stay on the internet longer and stay in that bubble longer. And mm -hmm. if it gets to the dark point where it becomes an echo chamber it's like oh this is what the world thinks it's like hey i'm the best in the world like gun rights are freaking amazing like yeah let's give everybody a nuke and like freaking 5,000 mm. ar 15s and maybe a puppy so that way they can pet their puppy and then shoot their guns like nah it's <laughs> it's a bigger <laughs> world out there than that <laughs> mm-hmm <laughs> 100 percent. yep 100 um and you know that's the easiest thing for us to do and it's the most comfortable down if you think about it all right like it's easy to create a world where you're not challenged because it's it's comfortable it's easy to be in um it's effortless uh but if we're saying to ourselves hey i really want to understand the world and i don't necessarily want to fall into those traps we have to be open to new information like there's no way around it Oh, yeah. You can say that again. Definitely no way around it. Heck, even that's how we grow stronger as human beings, where we just really challenge ourselves to reach our own next levels in life, even if it's not just with like professional life and all the other good stuff, but heck, even just at a basic level of changing a certain thought, maybe not a whole paradigm shift, but at least like, hey, here's something else to consider here. It's not like, hey, this ain't the true gospel, like going to heaven or hell in a way, metaphorically, but just something to consider. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. One thing I wanted to discuss with you, Dom, and get your opinion on, honestly, is that one of the early things I'll talk about in the book is this unique pressure that comes with social media. Um, and by pressure, you know, I have a firm belief that 
people feel more pressure than they ever have to keep up with other people. And I think the big part of that, or a big part of that is because our communities are now so global. And so we can look at people's lives from thousands of miles away on a screen and want to in some way be like that person, uh, live a similar life to that person, or maybe keep up and in some ways compete with that person. Um, so you, I know you're probably familiar with that old phrase, uh, keeping up with the Joneses. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I think, I think it's worse than it's ever been because now we can all keep up with each other. And at the end of the day, now it's like, you're keeping up with people you may not even meet or may not ever know. And you don't even know what's going on in their life. But if you look online, you can see a lot of people whose lives look awesome, but you don't really know what's going on with them when they put the screen down. And it's, it's, it's very unique now because that pressure can look so different, Dom. Like I could feel pressure to like get married, right? Or you could feel pressure to have a new home. And then, you know, your closest friend could feel pressure to have uh, a master's degree and have a great job. You know, so it can look different for everyone depending on the environment you come from and your culture. Um, but either way, I think social media has taken like um, people, people to people pressure to like this entirely new and kind of weird space. Oh yeah, man, definitely right about that. Heck, even like with, like the things that I do like with the coaching and the leadership training, like one of the things that usually comes up a lot is one of the things that holds us back from having explosive growth is the comparison gap and like the gap of between us and whoever are trying to put in front of us. And the thing is with social media, like you're so right, especially with timelines and everything, like it's stuff that you want people to see. People want to be their best. And the thing is sometimes people put too much pressure on themselves. Heck, even like with myself, with my podcast, like after starting it, like I didn't really know much about marketing from compared from myself now to like back then in 2017, when I was just getting started and just getting around other people and really learning like, Oh, so this is how you do an audiogram. Oh, like Instagram posts. Oh, email marketing. I'm like, man, I hate freaking emails, but you're saying email marketing works. And it's like, it's so true that there's a certain level of pressure there heck even reminds me of a time where um past guest had a conversation on facebook it's like hey i'm looking to get rid of like my tiktok here even though it grew like massively in like a few weeks because i haven't really got any much money from it and he just started this discussion like hey out of all of these which ones would you get rid of and instagram for me is probably the one i would get rid of in the conversation because the thing is it's like it's really just photos and I know all humans are visual creatures by default. Heck, even those maybe blind, they still have vision of basically wanted to accomplish what they want to accomplish is the fact that like, <laughs> like photos are great, but it's like, ah, uh, visual, eh, not so much. Like video content, it can be done, but like with putting it on the phone and everything, it's like kind of like an old soul in a sonic youth it's like hey if someone isn't <laughs> posted like an instagram video or a post in a week then probably might be best to leave them alone it's like oh god man it's like it, it, it's and the thing is like social media rewards you for the more time that you waste in well not waste depending on what you use it for but just that you're on the platform and it rewards you but at the same time it's like uh like let's just figure out which one is which man so yeah you're so right man that Social media has created this false sense of pressure on certain people on what they do. But the thing is, like, really just have to really know what your core values are and what you really want to get out of it. So uh, mm -hmm. I know you like to speak about unplugging from social media, man. So do you ever unplug from from every now and then or do you have a set schedule? Like, how how do you go about it and any tips on for folks on ways to unplug from the uh, social media machine? Yeah, man, I, I love that question. Um, yes, yeah, sometimes I do unplug. Um, and I do it in different ways, or I've tried it in different ways. You know, what's worked best for me personally is to kind of go cold, cold turkey with social media during the day. So kind of like during that, like, 
nine to six period. So if I'm like, you know, busy doing work and doing other things, I'll do my absolute best to stay off of the apps and actually don't use any of my notifications on the apps. So I really limit notifications, very limited with very limited with my time during the day. And then in the evening, I'll allow myself to scroll and use the apps, but uh, only to a certain degree. Like if I have other things I have to do and things I have to handle, I'm absolutely not going to spend all day engaging on the apps. Um, but, you know, I'll be honest, Donald, if I'm having like a relaxing weekend, I may jump on Twitter and see what's going on there. I may look at Instagram or something of that nature, um, but not to the point where I'm overwhelming myself with it. So that's what works for me personally. I do think unplugging at times is necessary especially if you're seeing yourself spending hours at a time on apps. You know, there are some people that spend five, six, seven, eight, nine, let's say even in some extreme cases, like 10 hours a day on social media. And so if you are one of those people, you are more than likely best, that, well, you're probably best at finding yourself in a situation where you want to say, I'm going to start drawing back. So instead of spending my regular seven hours, now I'm going to turn that into five and then try to turn that into three and a half or whatever that looks like. So there is a way for people to kind of wean themselves off. And for me, Dom, you know, I think the most important thing when we talk about unplugging is to first understand how is social media impacting your mental health? How is it affecting the way you think, right? So it's kind of like the subtitle of my book. How is it affecting your thinking, um, your feelings, and your actual behavior. And so if someone can take the time to figure out what that looks like, and that can look different for everyone, then I think that that can really help that person decide, do I really need to go cold turkey from social media? Or are these things playing a kind of minimal part in my life? And you know, if you're someone that social media is playing a minimal part, and um, you know, the way you think about yourself, the way you love yourself, your feelings, your actual behavior, then you may not have to unplug. Even if you do spend a few hours at a time, you may be fine to keep using the apps and doing your own thing. But if you are someone that um, spends a heavy amount of time on social media and it's making you feel deprived and sad and making you kind of view yourself in a lesser way, then you absolutely need to fully disengage until you're able to return to the apps to have a safer experience. Um, so there's more than one way to do it. I mentioned it in the book, but it can absolutely look different for everyone. You know, I think the biggest thing, like I said, Dom, is understanding how it's impacting you and how many hours at a time you're actually spending on social media. Oh, yeah. Powerful tips, baby. Powerful tips. Dave, my man's dropping that hot fire, baby. I'm telling you. That's right, indeed. <laughs> Y'all didn't even have to pay ten dollars for this mixtape, y'all. I'm telling you, it's some hot <laughs> fire right here. That's the day, but spend a hundred dollars right, buying copies of this book as well for your friends and family, y'all, because it's some hot fire, baby. That that marvelous mirage, indeed, man. Because you brought up some great tips, man. Like turn the notifications off the phone. Like that's freaking magical, man. Like I, I probably need to do that more often. My dang phone. Me personally, and heck, even taking breaks. Heck, even one of my close friends, he took a break from social media for like freaking seven years, while especially while he was um in his uh twenties. Like after, I think it was like ever since he was like twenty three, took like a break from it. Like Twitter, Facebook, like took like canceled both of them, and then recently came back on. And he's like, man, what the fudge is this? What have I missed, man? This is so <laughs> weird. Like Facebook, so weird. And Twitter's still silly, and it's like, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely got to take breaks and do it the right way, indeed, and have your basically keep your mind right and keep your brain care as your main care, indeed. Mm -hmm. Definitely, indeed, indeed. So, since my man's been a man, yeah, man, 100%, man, that's right. Got to keep it 100, as they say. <laughs> that's right gotta keep it 100 like a 100 grand candy ball y'all that's right yes indeed <laughs> yeah, i don't even know if they still make that candy <laughs> I, I think they do i feel like oh, they do 
Okay, good. Because that thing did taste good back then. I ain't going to lie. I, had, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I do like some Twix, but that ain't the point of the conversation. So, uh, since you've been on a bit on this uh, interview tour recently, promoting the book and the stuff you're doing, is there a question that you wish you would be asked more often? Hmm, that's a great one, man. I wish people were more curious about why, you know, these companies are worth so much money. Uh, you know, why is Facebook worth damn near a trillion dollars? You know, why is TikTok worth billions of dollars? I think I think TikTok's CEO was worth like $40 billion. You know, I think I wish people were more curious about like the business of it. But I think that's just me, though. Like, I like to know how things work. And I kind of have that business mind just from, you know, my consultant work and just on my natural interest. But there is a part of me that wish people were more curious to just know like man how did they get this company to the point where it's worth almost a trillion dollars but it doesn't cost any money you know like what are they doing how are they spending the money and i find that stuff really interesting dom because i'm like man you know these like i said you know before you know i don't see facebook is that different from like an amazon you know i kind of see them as the same thing but just in a different form they're just like these giant corporations that have a lot of influence a lot of capital and a lot of options when they do decide to do something in the world so um that's probably the biggest thing oh yeah you're so right man you're so right heck even i think um i'm not sure if it's from a book i read or maybe an upcoming guest on the show but um they mentioned how like facebook has gotten so big because it started off as a whole thing helping folks connect with their friends but basically using it helping our marketers advertise their stuff and then using that money to buy other companies like instagram that was its own separate entity heck even instagram wasn't even instagram at one point it was that i believe it was similar to like an airbnb but they just took the picture aspect and made it instagram and then facebook bought that and then whatsapp was apparently a fledging company where they were basically about to be bankrupt but facebook bought them because they had all that contact information so i think the reason why they're so freaking huge is because they have all that information especially specialized information too of like people's birthdays and their interests and it's like wait a second Mm -hmm. this is some targeted marketing ads here wait we can sell this to people wait a second this is like a billboard on steroids here people actually click like let's do this thing and it's like, oh, mm-hmm. wow, all right, billion dollar company. And they become a freaking conglomerate. And it's like, oh, all righty. Uh, they're absorbing stuff. All right, gotta love it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. They are making it happen. And they're doing it in a very, or at least they've done it, man, in a very aggressive and intelligent way. You know, I think just as someone that admires other business professionals, it's like you have to respect what they've been able to build, you know, it's pretty impressive. It's very impressive, at least in my mind, but there is a piece of me that's like, man, I mean, they're getting so big now to the point where you actually do need some level of like um, regulation. You know, you do actually need some type of oversight because they have so much power and influence that it makes you wonder how much, how much can you expect from this company Uh, how much can can you expect this company to actually regulate itself? You know, that's one question I've I've been asked and thought about. And I'm like, man, only to so to a certain degree, right? Because there's no influential company in history, or at least that I know of, that had this much money and power that just one day said, hey, you know what? We should stop doing less of those things that made us rich. You know, we know these things made us super powerful and super rich, but let's just do less of that so we can make less money next year. Like, those type of conversations, <laughs> yeah, man. Like, I, you know, those type of conversations don't really occur. That's just not how business typically functions. They usually try to make as much money as possible. So, it, it's very, very interesting, man. But yeah, they, they've done a great job growing their company and expanding, and and a lot of them have. Whether it be from you know Snapchat to TikTok to Twitter, um, they've they found some really good um, niches for them to be influential but now you know we're coming to a space where they absolutely need to make some changes so that their apps can be safer 
Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, man. Cause it's so true. It's like, I remember one motivated speaker was like, yeah, man, I want to dominate. I want to teach y'all how to dominate today, man. Like, shoot, I want the new world order. It's like, wait a second. What bro? <laughs> like, wait a second. <laughs> like hold your horses there. It's like, it was funny at the time hearing it at first and can understand what he was coming from, but it's like, yeah, man, you're right. It's like, and you have that amount of power, wealth and influence is like, uh, well, the human desire is to go for more and push through these limits. So let's see how far we can go and grow. And it's like, oh, yeah, I think y'all need to chill a bit. Heck, even with uh, people complaining so much that the government was putting, uh, I think, what, what they tried to put a, like a law in place for uh, Jeff Bezos and um, Richard Branson. So they have to go through certain channels to really get people to actually to truly fly into space or something like that. Even though folks mm -hmm. are just mad that they amass so much wealth that they're able to make that mess happen. <laughs> yeah. Jeff Bezos can go to space now whenever he pleases. You know, like that's uh that's a different level of wealth, man. That's a different type of money, you know. So and it's funny, man, I worked for Amazon for years and I worked with some really talented and smart people. So it's funny for me to look back and see where the company was then and where it's at now. I mean, he's a smart dude. You can't take anything from him. He's he's found some some really unique ways. And of course, you know, he hires a lot of intelligent people too. Um, but they found some really unique ways to expand their business. But yeah, going into space, man, that's not something I've never thought about, but it's absolutely a reality now for regular people. Heck yeah, it's like dang, I work so this man can get into space. I'm, I'm somewhat honored and somewhat confused and somewhat pissed. Like at the same time, like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, I better not go down that rabbit hole any further. So if your particular book Mirage was a food item, since books are food for the mind, what would it be and why? Okay. So I would say I'm trying to find the right food because it would definitely be nutritious, but it would also be bittersweet. Um, what would I want to call that? What fruit is that? You know, I'm not sure what to compare it to. I can more so describe it. So it, it would be good for you. It would be something you need to intake and should intake. But at the same time, it would be something that you read and intake and you it forces you to think about your own behavior and the choices that you make online and how social media is impacting your life. So I'm not sure what food is super nutritious, but might not taste that good. Well, there's probably a lot of things out here that don't taste good. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I'm not sure, man. Uh, I, I might have to come back to this one, but it would be it would be somewhere in that space. Yeah, it could probably be a citrus fruit in the family. It could be like a lemon or a grapefruit, maybe. Yes, uh, I'm liking. I'm liking the direction you're going in. I'm absolutely liking that. It's like, yeah, man, it's colorful, man. You make lemonade out of it, but man, if you look that lemon raw, like, oh, dang, uh, uh, uh. yeah. <laughs> Especially <laughs> if you had lemonade before an actual lemon, it's like, wait a second, what is this? Um, what is this illusion? I mean, again, you two. <laughs> See, like these are not the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like it's like Kool Aid without sugar. <laughs> <laughs> this does not work. It's like why did I do this to myself? <laughs> I should not try to drink this without sugar. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, speaking of Kool Aid, something that folks used to drink in their youth, man. So, any thoughts of uh, what to? Uh, I guess try to do when it comes to with the social media for the youth, man. Because the thing is, like the youth of today, they have a big advantage, but a disadvantage. The advantage is social media; they get to learn to pick up things quick, technology-wise. But the disadvantage is, is that they're going to prefer more screen time as opposed to face-to-face -face time. So, any thoughts on that, my man? Yeah, you know the interesting thing about that, that Dom is there hasn't, at least from what I've seen, been any proven like contested data that says that, you know, young people don't like to be face-to-face -face with other people 
or they're not able to adapt to change, right? Adapt to go from looking at a screen and interacting with the screen to um, being around friends. So that, you know, is a tricky topic because I haven't seen anyone prove that yet. But I really think, man, the biggest thing in relation to social media impacting young people is that I think adults need to do a better job at explaining and understanding how social media functions and understanding how it is impacting their kids because it is absolutely 100% impacting kids. Like there's no way around it. And we have children that are spending so much time online and forming their opinions about the world online, forming opinions about um, their politics and their culture and their family online. And most importantly, forming opinions about their self due to things that they're seeing online. And some of those opinions aren't positive. Some of those thoughts are not positive. You know, we have kids that um, can look online and see people with um, perfect bodies and think, okay, that's what I'm supposed to look like. And that, you know, that particular topic affects our young women a lot. And so I really think it's important for adults to realize that if we can educate kids around how social media functions, they'll be able to have a better experience when they get online because they'll be less likely to believe everything they see and less likely to fall into those traps that are laid out on, uh, well, laid out in social media culture. Oh, yeah, man. That's uh, another reason, I guess, why body positivity is a topic in itself now, man, because that, that's like the drawback. It's like, man, like, what the fudge with all these filters? Like, that's like a pet peeve of mine. It's like chicks with these filters. It's like, because some chick, if not a lot of them, they don't really need these filters to make them look like a freaking kid like some of them look like freaking chickens i'm like little little baby chicks i'm like i'm like chicks looking like actual chicks right now i'm like dude what <laughs> like man we don't want you in kfc like turn off the filter you you all right <laughs> like it's okay mm -hmm. it's okay to show without the filters in the uh makeup and such but it's like before it's like even before the social media and the technology is like they would always like looks would be a major thing and and guys, not as much, but we both still get it. We're always attracted to looks, eat, no matter what, no, what you slice. But now it's like, oh, yeah, everybody's got to be perfect. Everybody's got to have nine pack abs, and they got to be able to freaking have a George Foreman grill set of abs and really have the perfect set of arms. Like I have a whole freaking gun show, and every video's got to go viral. It's like, yeah, man. So, yeah, definitely mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting to see the, <laughs> I guess, next five to ten years and seeing how this uh generation is coming up is how gonna interact because it's like yeah some some good and the bad with it some sweet and sour yeah yeah and you know i i do worry about it dom honestly because i wonder like how do a lot of these kids feel on the inside in terms of you know fostering that sense of like self-love and being comfortable with who they are being comfortable with what their life is like because if you don't really know the difference, if you're ignorant to something, then I can't blame, you know, these kids that feel all these negative emotions when they get online. You know, I don't, I can't blame them if it's like these things are impacting them negatively and they might not, may not even understand why, because, you know, being a part of social media is just part of our culture now, you know, it's just an everyday thing. And so it does worry me because we do see these children that just seem like disengaged and not even just children, not even like, you know, super young. I mean, like teens, early twenties, mid twenties, we can even say thirties, like people that aren't, you know, that haven't been around for too long. Right. So I do worry about what that looks like for people in the long term and how these people are going to adapt as the world changes and as social media and social interactions continue to change. oh yeah that's right indeed definitely right about that indeed so any thoughts on uh stuff we should maybe do to maybe may take a step forward uh, a little maybe even find ways a little add a little ounce of prevention yeah so i would say the biggest ounce of pre prevention uh i think adults if they can do anything it's probably four things i'd say learn about misinformation um and how it affects people online uh, number one, 
learn about how social media affects young people, right? Because I think that if we can look at the next generation and understand some of their problems, we'll be better equipped to raise them, right? And to, to understand what they're dealing with and to help them with how they feel. And if I had to pick, well, actually I'll pick three. I'll pick one more thing. Um, I'd say, you know, that piece about echo chambers and understanding, well, you know, I'll say two more. Um, understanding echo chambers, how information is going out into the world and then being pushed right back at you. And then fourth, man, I'd say understanding how the algorithms work too, or at least having an idea. Um, you know, if we can understand why we see certain information uh, based of our interest and the things we like, then it'll make more sense for us when we get online um, and we see that ad for that, you know, pair of shoes that we've been thinking about buying and we wonder, you know, is Facebook listening to my conversations? Or, <laughs> yeah, you know, yes. like, if we, yeah, like if we can understand how the algorithms work and how they create the ads or at least have an idea of how information is filtered towards us, it just makes us more powerful. It makes us more equipped and it makes us a better fit to actually um, share information with people that need the information. Uh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, there's some powerful stuff right here. Indeed. Definitely got to have my man back on in the future, baby, because my man's been dropping this hot fire. Indeed. Definitely some hot fire. Indeed. That's right, folks. Watch out for the Mecco Chambers, y'all. That's right. That's right. Don't get in that vacuum, y'all. That's right. You get sucked in. It's like, hey, what's up, my fellow dirt bunnies? What's up, fellas? Like, hey. We all mm -hmm. dust bunnies together. Like, wait, I'm a human. Wait, why am I? What? <laughs> like, <laughs> echo, yeah. and it says echo chamber on the back. And like, ha ha, we got another one. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the game. That's right, indeed. That's Triple H, indeed. That's right. That's right, indeed. <laughs> oh, man. Well, coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive, and that is if you're to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again, but this time you're in a current year with all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? Wow, what advice would I give to myself? Um, I would probably tell myself to understand that you know, success, or at least up until this point for me, success has really been like a marathon. Like it has really been this constant work that comes with different challenges and comes with different rewards. So I would probably tell myself that, and I'd also more than likely tell myself to try to do your best to be happy and joyful and peaceful in what you have, while also working towards what you want. You know, Dom, I think one of my flaws is that I'm always um, kind of, or I can get into a space where I say, I'm going to be happy when this happens or when I do this thing. And, you know, man, I've learned that life is, well, time is finite. You know, we have this, this little bit of time to do what we're here to do um, and to get things done, but it's easy to spend a ton of time thinking about the next thing, you know, the next thing you're going to accomplish. But I probably tell myself, you know, do less of that and spend more time um, working, right? Grinding for what you want, but still being happy with what you have. Um, because sometimes you just got to stop and smell the roses and, you know, look at the sun and be happy with what you've accomplished. Oh, uh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Indeed. That's right. That's right. Be happy now with what you got as you're on your way to reaching your summit that's right don't be summit obsessed y'all that's right that's right indeed that's right indeed be like i'm happy when i get that call get that significant other that soulmate and realize oh shoot yeah get that house that's right get that job promotion like nah fam like sometimes the chase is better than the catch <laughs> mm. that's right that's right indeed because once you get that catch it's like all right so what the fudge is next oh yeah mm -hmm. let's see some brownies like yeah yeah brownies yeah yeah yeah, I'm gonna have these brownies right here. Not ain't it? But uh, yeah, man. So there you go. There you go. So for those who've enjoyed the conversation and need to buy freaking ninety nine thousand copies of your magical books and share it around like butter on bread and peanut butter with some jelly in between, some 
wonderful bread slices. What's the best way for folks to keep up with your, what you're doing and buy some copies of your book and all that wonderful smooth jazz? Yes, sir. So the book is available on Amazon. Um, so the title is Mirage, How Social Media Impacts the Way We Think, Feel, and Behave. Um, so I focus on those three things. And the book is on Amazon and it's an audio book, ebook, and paperback book. So depending on how you process and you know, like to learn information, I have I have it out there. So yep, it's available on all three of those functions and available on Amazon. Woohoo! Well, there you have it, folks. Go on out there to the wonderful Amazons. Check out my man's wonderful book indeed. And the good news is it's an audio book for two of y'all. So that's right. You can listen to it while you're on the go. My man is reading it for himself, y'all. So that's right. So for those who are always on the go and don't have time to actually sit down and read and don't want to be fully crazy and try to read the book while you're driving, then definitely pick up the audio book too. <laughs> indeed. And keep up with what he's doing. So... Any parting words before we close up shop, my man? No, sir. Just a thank you to you, Don, for giving me an opportunity. I appreciate you. Thanks a bunch for tuning in and setting aside some of your time to listen to this wonderful podcast, Going North. If you really enjoyed what you heard, do me a solid and share this with your network and someone that you care about that would get something out of it, too. And be sure to subscribe to hear more. And heck, even check out the backlog if you would like, because there are hundreds of episodes to choose from, and they just keep getting better and not better.